You are looking at what is now the site of the Edgar Thompson Steel Plant in Braddock, Pennsylvania. But on July 9, 1755, it was a sprawling thick forest along the banks of the Monongahela River. That morning, the advance guard of General Edward Braddock's British Army began the crossing of the river. The army had marched from Fort Cumberland near the end of May and had forged a road through the dense wilderness of western Pennsylvania to reach their goal of Fort Duquesne at the confluence of three rivers in present-day Pittsburgh. Braddock's flying column was just nine miles from their objective, numbering 1,400 in rank and bringing with them artillery that could easily destroy the walls of the fort. Thomas Gage led the advance guard containing British Grenadiers, New York Provincials, and elements of the 44th and 48th foot to the other side of the river. This was the most feared part of the campaign as soldiers anticipated an ambush while crossing the river, but those fears were washed by high morale when no assault occurred. Following Gage's advance guard was the work party under John St. Clair's command, who were constructing the road for the main body who were nearing the crossing. They also had with them two six-pounder cannons and a small wagon train for tools. But as they closed the gap, the French and native forces were in the process of enacting their defense of Fort Duquesne. Their leader, Captain Beaujeu, is leading three columns in haste down a native path to meet the British. While he had hoped to catch the British at the crossing, delays led to the natives convincing Beaujeu to instead ambush in the woods. It is possible that the natives were given the go-ahead to lie in wait on the forested heights that the British would soon pass, awaiting Beaujeu to give the signal to attack. Beaujeu had with him just a hundred French marines and a hundred Canadian militia, as well as 700 native allies from 20 different tribes. Somewhere in the early afternoon, the head scouts of the British column are following the native path to Chanupinstown, present-day Lawrenceville in Pittsburgh, when they see the French forces on the path across a ravine. The grenadiers move quickly into position and exchange lethal volleys with the French. Within the opening shot, Beaujeu is killed, which causes the French to halt. But soon, the forest around the British erupt as the natives commence their ambush. Cage calls for the working party to be committed to battle. The six-pounders are placed into position, but in the dense foliage, they are of little use. The main body are in the process of wading across the river when they hear the sounds of war in the distance. They begin to move rapidly toward the sounds of battle. At the same time, Gage begins to fall back to regroup with the main army. But upon the narrow pathway, the two elements of the British army collide into one another. Confusion causes orders to go awry and disintegrate within the British ranks. Provincial forces attempt to weave into the foliage to fight the natives on their own terms but become ripped to shreds by crossfire. Braddock arrives with his staff, which includes a young George Washington. Their presence partially strengthens the stance of the British as now the regular units of the 44th and 48th are on the field, but their European tactics of battle lines produced little success. All it achieves is furthering the traffic jam upon the road. As Braddock personally tries to rally his men while on horseback, he becomes mortally wounded. With the general down, any remaining cohesion snaps and the army begins to be swept up by the advancing French and natives. In the chaos, Washington, who had only prior been a lieutenant colonel, found himself organizing a retreat of mass confused and panic-stricken soldiers back across the Monongahela. The colonial troops would try to hold off the advancing enemy to allow the rest of the army to flee across the river. After three hours of fierce fighting, Washington and the British army abandon the battlefield. The French forces will move in and secure the field as the natives loot the bodies of the dead and the wagon train, killing or taking captive women, children, or any other soldiers remaining. Over a thousand of Braddock's forces were now killed or wounded in one of the greatest military disasters. The shocking result of a much smaller French and native force defeating one of the world's best armies would bring to light the severity of the struggle for North America back in Europe. In 1756, the Seven Years' War would officially begin across the world. It would not be until 1758 that the British would finally secure the Forks of the Ohio. 
The experiences at Braddock's defeat would aid in strengthening the resolve of colonists who would ultimately rebel against the British two decades later. Whoa, you actually uh, watched the whole video. Well, uh, thank you for watching my uh, crummy little video made of construction paper, poor audio, and me as the greatest sound effect artist ever. And I'm just amazed with my musket sounds. Uh, if you want to have further information, delve it into Braddock's Defeat. Uh, for those in the literature field, I recommend checking out Braddock's Defeat by David L. Preston. This is pretty much the end all be all books on Braddock's Defeat, at least up to this time. And if you're more of a visual learner, there's of course the Paladine Entertainment, uh, When the Forest Ran Red. So between the two items here, you'll find something you'll be interested in. Thank you for watching Readout Productions. I'm hoping to do more videos like this construction paper, map, battlefield, whatever I'm gonna call this series. So if you like this video, let me know and tell me what other battles or events in history you'd like to see given the construction paper touch. Thank you for watching.